All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Austin Smedley, the host of Beyond the Well. This is episode five, and I'm real excited about this one. We've gone back and forth for a little while, but I'm very happy to talk to one of the inspirations, actually, for me starting this show, Mr. Paul Wagner. He was the founder of Operation Werewolf, author, and plenty of other things that I'm excited to go ahead and get into. So thank you, Paul. I appreciate you coming on, man. It's no problem. It's just pronounced Wagner, though. But Okay. My apologies, Wagner. All right. No worries. <laughs> yeah, that German pronunciation, that kind of... Is, is that where your name comes from, Germany? Uh, it comes from Holland, actually. The uh, <laughs> One of the ancestry on my dad's side was uh, Gerosen from Scandinavia, but they moved to a little town called uh, Wageningen in Holland, and the name was anglicized to Wagner, which is why it's spelled with the two G's and two E's. Oh, okay. Yeah, some, uh, my last name's Smedley, so it's a little... Gets a little finicky there, just with that European pronunciation. Seeing as I'm born in America, kind of loose touch on how to pronounce those things. But so, sure. beyond the well, what I do here, we like to go into religion and spirituality and Operation Werewolf again in the work that you've done, also with guys like Jack Donovan and other folks like that. The religion and spirituality side of Operation Werewolf is something that I've always been very interested in. So if you can go ahead and Give me a little bit of backstory and the people listening as well on what your spiritual beliefs are, how they came from. I, I remember you mentioned once I heard you say that your father is a Baptist preacher. Uh, he's an Orthodox priest. Okay, so he, is... He's, uh, yeah, he's, he's my dad. Is uh, you know I, I come from a religious upbringing, you know, so uh, it was always, I guess, part of my life. Um, but yeah, as I said, my, my dad is Orthodox. Uh, he's a priest, but growing up, um, he was Anglican, um, and he made the switch over because uh, these days, sort of the way everything else is going, I guess the church is going more and more in a progressive direction, which for him is not necessarily a positive thing. He's uh, more interested, I guess, in tradition than in things being changed to the way that people want it nowadays. But um, probably that covered a, a lot of it. But, um, you know, I, I knew from a, a really young age that Christianity was not a... Uh, a direction that I was going to stay with. It didn't make sense to me um, from a cultural standpoint, I think, mostly. Uh, even when I was a kid, uh, I, I just didn't feel any connection to any of it. And uh, now that I, I got older and, you know, I explored Satanism when I was young and paganism and all the rest of that kind of stuff and settled sort of on, um, I guess, with a lot of the guys in my own club, which is the Wolves, on a sort of I don't know, modern expression of, of sort of Norse paganism, but I would not say that what we do anymore could be really considered to be Norse paganism. It's kind of become an organic thing of its own. Um, and so it's it's kind of one of these things when you're talking about spirituality and religion with people, it's difficult to talk about it without calling it something or naming it something. But the minute that you name it something, you kind of put yourself into a box and you kind of get attached to that sort of thing, which I think is, is oftentimes more of a an anchor that can drag somebody down rather than can hold somebody somewhere um, good. And so I, I don't know what I would call what I do anymore, but certainly I'm interested in a spiritual expression of life and believe that there is an unseen uh, power in, in man that can be generated and so on and so forth through the practice of ritual and a lot of other means, but I don't know what I would call myself, you know? Yeah, there absolutely doesn't need, need to be any labels. I mean... My upbringing was very, very, very Christian as well, and the family that I had, they attended churches that were, like uh, your father expressed disdain for, were the progressive-minded, and I, I realized myself, too, that it's going to be very difficult to fit myself in this box, because it is limiting, absolutely. And I, I have also seen some similarities in Operation Werewolf's doctrine, and just the, the words I've seen, I've heard you speak, or I've read... And uh, I absolutely see the connection there with, like, LeVay and Satanism. Like, I was able to do some work with Anton LeVay's son uh, last year. I helped him put on a show, and I got immersed in that community. And again, there was kind of a disconnection there between who I feel I am and my own spiritual practices and my own disciplines and what it is that they're doing. So it, there's absolutely no need to yeah, label well, it. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, with, with the Christianity, most modern Christianity is entertainment. Um, there's not a great deal of... Um, of deeper spiritual truth expressed in a, in sort of a modern mega church. You go in there and mostly it's to make people feel good, uh, to feel good about themselves and who they are without a whole lot of meat. Um, and as far as living and Satanism, you know, it was something interesting when I was a teenager, uh, but certainly something that I feel like I evolved 
out of. I, I won't say past because that's kind of sort of er- an arrogant thing to say, but it, it wasn't for me for, for long. Um, and, and that's just simply because I don't see the need to, to add a kind of religiosity or a spiritual expression to the idea of something that's basically just uh, humanism or, or Nietzscheanism or something that was done better um, in Might is Right. You know what I mean? There's not, there doesn't need to be, I think, this Satanism label for something that's just uh, Nietzschean or, or whatever it is, you know? And I think oftentimes people stretch for spiritual expression where there could just as easily be a philosophical one, you know? How would you describe that divide there between a like, spiritual expression and a philosophical one? Like, what's the difference there? I think that one, one of the things that becomes pretty necessary is, is a sort of a connection with something that's not merely theoretical, hypothetical, or intellectual um, is probably what it comes down to for me. I think that, and I, I won't speak for, you know, modern-day Satanists, but I think that most of ritual trapping in... in most of the Satanists that I've seen has been very uh, almost play acting or or specifically used for psychological use or, or whatever, and they take a very intellectual approach to things. I think that spirituality and religion has to be a bit more visceral, and I think it calls for something that suspends this idea that reason or intellectualism can explain everything or are the be-all and end-all of everything. And I think that through the use of ritual and the layering use of ritual in our lives that one isn't necessarily just doing things that have a, an only psychological effect on themselves anymore. I think there's a very real thing that begins to develop from that. It's difficult to explain, but that it, it starts to layer something within an individual's life. And and that thing begins to grow and can be interfaced with uh, during these times of ritual through various uh, methods of, of connection, which are, are extremely varied. Yeah, the definitely the expression, like you, you dressed up atheism is what uh, Anton LaVey's daughter Zena wound up calling what her father created towards the end. I think that's pretty accurate. And one of the differences yeah. that I've seen with how Operation Werewolf and uh, yourself and the Wolves of Vinland, of course, too, the way that you express your spirituality, there's always been an emphasis on physical prowess as well. It's not just sitting down in this this dark little room and reading like reciting whatever page from whatever archaic text rather it's an approach that your physical needs and your physical prowess should be approached as not just being its own separate thing but there's a connection between physical activity and spiritual wellness well there's not just a connection there there's no separation um physicality you know this is this is a very it's a very um christian concept that the physical body is somehow separate from the spiritual uh, body or, or the mental one or whatever, and that there's these divisions. But for us, there is no division. There, there's not a, a physical body and a spiritual body. We, we exist in this one thing, and this is how we interface with reality. I mean, a, there, are, there are passageways and, and, you know, as one of my friends Craig says, doorways in the flesh itself that, that can be... Uh, accessed in in various ways through intense physical exercise or or deprivations or any of these other things and that there's there's secrets and answers in the body itself and in the blood itself um that cannot they can't be separated there can't be this idea of the physical body being separate from the spiritual it's it's all part of the same thing and so when one atrophies it all atrophies it's it's a linchpin you know It's, it's all held together by the same thing and so we, we have to put an emphasis on the physical and, and that we believe that the physical form should be strong because that's the only acceptable conveyance for the spirit and the mind. You know, it's, it's all one thing. Yeah, it seems to come down to, to uh, just the concept of discipline, you know, getting yourself up and making sure that you, you get that run in or you, get, or you lift when you're supposed to or any of these other practices – you can't have one without the other. Like, I believe Joe Rogan right. said it. Yeah, one of his shows that if your yeah, body, the, he said something along the lines of, if your body's depressed, then you can't expect to be anything other than depressed mentally either. Absolutely. You know, we, we always say, uh, one of the things that I say in Operation Werewolf is that physical training is never just physical. It It's a mental process and a spiritual process. And I know I keep saying that these are all one thing, but of course, 
we have to refer to them with these different concepts because that's where we're limited. We have to use this limiting language to refer to them. But when we push through something intensely uncomfortable or we force ourselves into these uncomfortable situations, it, it not only strengthens us spiritually, mentally, but it inoculates against that discomfort as well, you know, and, and it makes us different and it makes us who we are. And there are, there are all these things that can be seen as specifically physical, um, but that they're never just physical. There's always another element to them. Yeah, there's always that, that natural, there's, there's something, something about it. I was having a conversation with uh, someone earlier when someone who isn't exactly the most fit person in the world, but we were discussing how you can see someone completely revolutionize and change their life just by picking up some weights every now and then. And eventually when you start building up that resistance training, you start being able to apply that in your everyday life. Now all of a sudden the goals that That's you right. set for yourself five years ago, they seem a little more real to you. Like I can refer back to times when I've been on runs and I've wanted to quit, I've wanted to give up, but when my lungs are filled, they're burning. For whatever reason, the ideas and the goals that I'm that I've set for myself outside of this discipline, they become more real because sure. yeah, by becoming hard physically, the things that are perceived as being hard in everyday lives really aren't as much at all. They're a lot easier to grasp. Yeah. And I think that there are other uh, conceptual ideas that begin to form in the mind as well. When, when we start to transform the physical form and we start to see the physical transformation, whether that's becoming leaner or, you know, with less fat on us or, or putting more muscle on or whatever it is that we're trying to do, there's something that happens there as well where you start to look at these ideas and say, well, this, these, are, these are objective things that are happening here and they're happening because of work. And if I'm working for them, then I deserve them, which means that if someone is not working for it and putting that work in, then they don't deserve it. And it begins to shatter these notions of, of sameness, you know, that the modern world is so riddled with it. No, this person is not equally as apt or, or adapted to this job or this thing as this other person is. Some of this just takes work. And that even someone with poor genetics or um, who, who starts out from a lesser level can make himself greater through an intense amount of work because discipline, conviction, and consistency can go a long way. And, and take us much further than someone who was maybe born with genetics alone. Um, and so there's a lot of concepts, I think, that come along with this stuff. And with the spiritual thing, you know, one of the, one of the things that you'll see, especially in this so-called Norse pagan world, is you'll, if you go to one of these things, you see a staggering amount of obese people, of feeble people, frail people, and you realize that these are people who are involved in some new religion of acceptance uh, or, or whatever it is, and that there's no possible way that there could be any real fire to what it is that they're doing. Otherwise, it would manifest itself in the physical. And that these are people who separate and they say, well, I don't need to do this or I don't need to look like X or Y. And they miss the point that it's not about how you look. It's not about what you need. It's about the fact that you lack so much discipline in all these areas and you're incapable even of taking control over this physical form. How can you have control over anything else or any other situation? If you cannot, if you can't start with self-discipline and self-mastery, how can you expect to have control of anything else in your life? What I think would be interesting about that too, my own experience in the, uh, like the Norse pagan kind of world is that they'll reject the God of Christianity as being unnatural or anything of that sort. And they'll accept gods like Odin and Thor and Tyr because they are gods of nature. Yet they treat the body that nature gave them with the same kind of disregard that they, they gave the religion that they grew up in, that being Christianity. So that's, that's an interesting. Sure, there's a lot of, there's a lot of disconnects there. And I think, I think largely, um, the, the, so, you know, this, this word pagan doesn't mean anything really anymore, you know, and it's largely become just, yeah, an, a big sort of uh, group hug kind of, and we, we don't have any interest in that. And for a long, long time, uh, we've been, we don't call ourselves Norse pagan or Germanic pagan, and we don't certainly affiliate or associate with any groups um, who consider themselves to be that, especially not on a national level. Um, there's just no interest level there. We just don't have anything in common, really. Yeah, especially with the modern, uh, at least my my gen the younger generation rejecting a lot of the Christian traditions of old, and then naturally you kind of have these hang-ons that aren't really convicted about the ideas of paganism or 
Norse Paganivs or, or Wicca or whatever it is, these hang-ons kind of show up and they'll bring the entire group down as a whole. Sure. Well, that, and that's, that's a truth of group dynamic, no doubt. So this, uh, just the lack of discipline, the lack of conviction that is seen in other groups, like we referenced Norse Paganism or Satanism or anything like that, was that an influence for you and uh, like your brother Matthias or whoever to go off on your own way and start your own thing? I mean, I, I think that probably what influenced us the most was just a lack of of, of genuineness or, or a lack of uh, sincerity, really, that we saw in a lot of places. And kind of one of the reasons that we started it, I was 20, I think, at the time. I'm, I'll be 35 here in a couple months, so close to 15 years. And, you know, one of the things that, that we were looking for was a group that was more than just a group and, and something that we felt should exist in the world and didn't exist in the world. And we were tired of insincere friendships and insincere people in general. Um, and I think that when we started the group, it, was not, it wasn't with the intention of starting some sort of spiritual community. I think that that was a natural outcropping of trying to organically allow a community to grow and that community will naturally have a desire or have a need for some kind of spiritual expression even if that is an expression that's only used in private ritual to bind the group more and more strongly to itself which for us is what ritual in the wolves actually is um with operation werewolf i can't speak as much to that because what I write is not necessarily what is practiced. Um, it's very easy to look at a bunch of Operation Werewolf groups out there, and you can see ones that are on the hard right um, who, are, who are doing a bunch of stuff that's absolutely not in line uh, with anything that I've written, even like if you just read the Werewolf Manifesto, there's people who are, probably have never read that. Um, as far as the spiritual stuff goes, I know there's, there's Orthodox guys, there's Christians, um, there's pagans, there's all different kinds of people um, who have these Operation Werewolf groups, so I can't speak too much to it on a whole. I can only really speak for my group, uh, the Wolves. And so, yeah, for us, you know, I think it was it was a need that was fulfilled and, and was allowed to sort of grow organically, and so we tried to allow it to do that. Yeah, Organically, you kind of come back to this concept of it being organic, because a lot mm -hmm. of groups come together it's, it's kind of the concept of tribe like you place a lot of emphasis on that and so have guys like like jack donovan is tribe an absolute necessity in order to really grow and develop spiritually i mean i i think that really depends on what you mean there's a lot of really good quotes out there from brilliant writers who who, who express themselves and, and found their best expression in solitude and i think that there's something to be said for that as well i mean all the way back to looking at the desert fathers of the church, you know, these were guys who were isolationists pretty much. Um, ditto for a lot of the holy men in India and things of this nature. For us, uh, my spiritual practice individually does not look identical to my spiritual practice with the wolves. And what I mean by that is when you're, when you're doing a ritual or you're, you're allowing this spirituality to grow organically within a group construct, what you're trying to do is sort of find this this vesica pisces i guess between the members and where their common ground is what's the what's the shared language what are the shared stories what are the shared truths uh the shared myths and what is the framework that begins to appear and then what's the flesh that begins to grow on that framework um for me no a group is not mandatory for my spiritual growth or expression but i will say a complete human, I think, probably, uh, yes. I think that, I, I agree that man is a social animal, and I think that uh, a, a spiritual expression in a group is different than one that you'll get completely isolated. Um, I think the lessons that being in a group has taught me on, on both a spiritual level and a mental one have been invaluable for me um, as someone who's had difficulty, um, I guess, interacting with people uh, on a, on a meaningful long-term scale, this has been probably the great work for me, um, the biggest project and the greatest one of most importance that I've undertaken in my life. So, you know, I, I would say yes and no, and it would depend on the person. Yeah, it's a person-by-person -person basis. I, I, can express, I, I can express sympathy definitely for having issue with connecting with people 
on a long lasting level, uh, uh, apart from just a, Hey, how you doing type type scenario. And my own spiritual growth doesn't necessarily depend on the actions of others or even the group that I've decided to surround myself with. But it seems like it's difficult to separate that sometimes from this lone wolf mentality of, I want to go out and do all these things on my own. I don't need anybody else, but in fact you do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I have a, an incredibly and in, intensely strong, um, love conviction and loyalty for the individuals in the wolves um that's grown over a long period of time a lot of these people were already family to me before uh, some of these guys i've known since i was eight years old um a lot of them have been with us from the very beginning so 15 years you know uh, a little bit under half my life so yeah i mean they're incredibly important to me and, and losing any one of them is like uh it is like losing a family member. I mean, when we say in our group that these guys are our brothers, we do mean it. Um, and so, yeah, for me, it's become an incredibly important part of, of not only my life, but yeah, my spiritual expression too, because my year revolves around our monthly uh, gatherings, each one of which has a, a ritual story, sort of a, a mythological cycle that it follows throughout the year and is then repeated in the following year. Um, so for me, you know, yeah, the, the, the group is very tied in with that. But I guess as far as spiritual growth, spiritual expression, a lot of that happens for all of us, I think, individually. Um, and then we bring that back uh, to the group, if that makes sense. So it's like a manifestation of all the work that you do individually at these monthly meetings? I would say, I would say yeah, in a way. You know, you're always looking to, to bring things back. Um, to the crew, whether that's skills or, or knowledge or, you know, um, leverage, wealth, whatever it is. Um, and sometimes those things that are brought back are, are spiritual concepts, ideas that then are discussed, you know, kind of chewed on by the, by the group um, and then sort of assimilated, um, which is the same thing that happens when we eat anyway. A portion of that maybe not, doesn't make it, you know, and is excreted and a portion of it is assimilated into the into the meat and and so i think that's how it is with any idea you know and and this is a way that we've kept things moving and growing and i think that our spiritual expression in the group continues to evolve it has a root in what we've always done but it's allowed to grow it's given room to grow and and it's fed regularly you know in order so that it can grow aside from the uh just the benefits of having people around you that can hold you accountable and make sure that, you know, it's inspiration to actually do what you, what it is that you need to do, what you said you were going to do. What are the benefits to having a tribe that you can work with, do ritual with, and even live with at some points in your life, as opposed to someone who doesn't have that? Like, what are the benefits outside of accountability? I mean, I think that if we look simply at the sort of the selfish human benefits that you can get, there's a great deal of leverage that a group of of powerful individuals can have in the world as opposed to an individual. Um, you know, there's a lot of leverage even just thinking financially, but there's also a great currency in saying if I can show up with 20 people and these people can only show up with 10, uh, that's sort of how a lot of conflicts have been settled in the past. So from that level, you have a benefit as well. You also essentially have an auxiliary mind at all times because you can call on these people who know you sometimes clearer than you might know yourself to act as sort of an external brain for you. Um, you get good advice. There, there are guys in this group who have an incredible uh, skill set that they are willing to share with you. Um, so on all those levels, just as a resource, it's incredible. But I think, and not to sound trite, um, the best benefit and that someone can get from it is, is family is, is love. And I mean, love in the purest expression of it, which is just, uh, loyalty. And, and that if our honor and our group is defined by that concept, our honor is defined by loyalty, which means that any opportunity I, or one of the guys in the group has to show loyalty to one of the other ones that grows our honor. And we believe in this concept of honor, almost as luck, which is that the more acts that I commit to build that honor, the more powerful I am and the easier it is for me to do them in the future. But also the, the more that my personal power and sort of gravitas grows, you know, the more control I have if I walk into a room because humans can feel that. They can feel that progressive motion, that progressive action. It's like a wheel. And when it's moving fast enough, it can grind down a lot of stuff. 
Um, and I think that for us, that's probably most of the guys would say that those things are the best. Yeah, there's nothing trite about it. I mean, having family around you, having family, it's it's just a part of our instincts as humans. Like, it, we definitely work sure. a lot better if we have it as opposed to when we don't. So kind of bring this all around to kind of close off real quick. One of the questions that I had that, um, you know, for people who don't know, I have a pretty decent understanding of what uh, the writings that you've done, the lectures that you've given, just the, kind of what, what you're generally about. But how I discovered you was through Operation Werewolf. I think I just came across you on Instagram yeah. or something, had no clue who you were. But for those who don't know, how did Operation Werewolf begin? What does it mean to you? What is it? Um, it started as a, as actually a, a, a project given to me by a former teacher of mine um, who, who sort of gave me the challenge to take what we had done with the wolves and to make it something that others could express or could use as a jumping off point in order to spread this idea of um, of this this sort of reinvigorated wolf cult uh, aspect that we do um, and, and spread that. And so that was the original concept of saying, what have we done? What have we gotten success with? What's worked for us as a group who's been around for a long time? And how can other people use that to... To, to great benefit, I would say, in their own lives. And so this is the initial concept of Operation Werewolf. And since then, it's been an ongoing project of trying the best I can um, with my limited mind, um, my limited ability to articulate and all the rest, to, to explain what that is and to explain what's important and to try to maintain this sort of uh, rabid, positive nature in a world that oftentimes will leave us feeling very hollowed out and very negative. Um, and that to show people that that can be basically battled against through these concepts that we um, sort of preach with Operation Werewolf. Well, you definitely ha- you definitely found an audience. You know, people like myself or other people who are willing to take up this banner and fly it, put it on their back. It's like a constant reminder of the true north, what you're chasing on a daily basis. Yeah, for me, it's been uh, it's been something. Uh, wonderful to to have been able to be involved with. Um, I, I believe that like everything in this existence, I, I, nothing lasts forever, um, and I always wonder what its future will be. But that's probably at this point not for me to determine. Um, so I'm always looking forward to the opportunities to do what I say um, and to not be someone who is a uh, do as I say and not as I do type person. And so I think in the next coming uh, couple of years. I've, I've definitely got to uh, turn the focus back inward a lot. I've, I've had a very external focus on trying to help this thing get its legs underneath it and help a lot of groups get their legs. Um, and sometimes that can be at the expense of your own uh, personal growth and so on and so forth. But um, it's always ongoing, and it's, it's been a real honor to be able to be a part of And I've met some of the, I, I believe, best men and women around the world as a product of it. So. As a young man, I'm just getting going with it, but definitely I am already starting to see the benefits and so are thousands of other people around the world. So I would like to express gratitude to you again for coming on and your work, uh, the Field Manual for Creating Work with Heart, for being what inspired me or in part what inspired me to found, like to start this project, this podcast. So thank you, Paul. I appreciate you coming on, man. I really do. Sure. Hey, thank you, Austin. I appreciate you, man. All right, man. I appreciate you too. Thank you.